Um, perfect. So uh, now I have the great pleasure to uh, welcome our speaker for today, Tim Schwanen. Um, Tim Schwanen is professor of uh, transport geography at the University of Oxford in the School of Geography and the Environment. And there, Tim uh, is also director of the transport study unit and uh, a supernumerary fellow at St. Anne's College. He is uh, one of the editors of Environment and Planning F, which is uh, the environment and planning journal focusing more on, on philosophy, theory, uh, but also, also methods and practice. And he serves on the advisory um, editorial advisory board for a number of other um, mobility focused journals and was formerly editor in chief um, of the Journal of Transport Geography. Uh, Tim received his PhD from the Department of Human Geography and Planning at Utrecht University in the Netherlands um, and joined tra Oxford's Transport Studies Unit in 2009. And since last autumn, he is also um, a fellow of the UK's Academy for Social Sciences. Now, um, Tim's research focuses on the everyday mobilities of people, of goods, um, but also of information. And it's very international in outreach and interdisciplinary in character um, and examines among others, low carbon mobilities, especially in cities um, and socio-technical transitions of mobilities, but also, and that will be a focus today, um, social and spatial inequality and justice um, along different axes. So uh, without further ado, um, welcome Tim. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Leo, and thank you for this generous introduction. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Where... There it is. Good. So, as Leo was saying, my field is really questions of transport and mobility, usually in cities, and that's what I'll be talking about today. Um, why questions of daily transport are important in a transition context? Um, you can answer that question in a, in a range of different ways. Perhaps the most direct is that transport is the fourth most important source of CO2 emissions. Um, and is undergoing a lot of changes that are pulling the sector in, in a variety of different directions, some of which will reduce emissions, some of which have actually the, the potential of increasing those. But there are also substantive reasons beyond, uh, beyond the, the emission side of things, because I think it's a transport, because so much is happening there, it's a really good way, a really good uh, area to, to, to think about multiplicity of change and many different changes happening at the same time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But actually, I want to talk most about just transformation, because uh, as I will try to explain, it's really important that the changes in transport are not only focusing on, on making transport cleaner, but especially also reducing all kinds of inequality. And I want to sort of talk you through what I think just transformation means. But just sort of as a start, I'm sure you will have seen figures like this. Previously, um, passenger transport is, is accounts for about two thirds, almost two thirds of all emissions. Uh, it's also studied much more also in the transition community. Um, and if you're looking for a topic, uh, and, and you don't know what to do, by all means, focus on freight because that's heavily understudied, and we can talk about that in the Q and A if if you want. But you can basically say that about forty percent of all emissions from transport are related to road transport in cities. So it's a huge, uh, it's of huge significance, and that's why there is uh, so much emphasis on this in research, in policy, in practice. And uh, the trend doesn't look very good. This is, uh, these, these are figures uh, of, of the current century, and you can see a very stark growth over time. You, you can see a little bit of a blip, 2008, uh, sort of the financial crisis. Of course, things will have changed 
uh, on the back of um, the pandemic, where we saw massive decreases in emissions, but we're currently very much on the upward trajectory again. And my suspicion at this point in time is that in about 10 years from now, we'll look back and say and see that the pandemic hasn't brought about any structural change, but is more another blip, albeit a bigger one than, than the financial um, crisis has been. And where in the world is that growth occurring? It's occurring in many different places, uh, but particularly in Asia. Um, and we see regions like um, Africa coming up, albeit from a low base. But even in Europe, we see um, we see a bit of a mixed pattern, uh, but, but sort of on the back of the economic crisis of uh, sort of 2008 and, and subsequent years, we've seen gradual growth again, and we're certainly not where we should be going at this point in time. In terms of why transport is a good place to, to, to look at the multiplicity of change, there are different ways you can express this, but I think this diagram that I took from, uh, from a paper by Frank Gales published a couple of years ago shows that very clearly that there is a lot going on. There are, in, in his terminology, there are many niche developments that are competing with each other, that, that are sort of having an influence on the regime. There is actually not one regime when we talk about urban transport. There are second, a series of complementary regimes where things are also happening. So his argument really is that we need to focus on, on, on whole system change and, and move away from the, the, the you, you could say the classic transition pattern that is driven by one or two niches um, that, that disrupt the regime under the influence of, of landscape developments. So uh, I, I completely agree with, with his view that we need much better understanding of what is happening at regime levels and that we need to think about regimes as more dynamic as we often do. Um, and I think here, again, there's sort of a, a range of questions for empirical research that really need to be need to be addressed. Having said all that, I think it is quite clear that what is happening at both REAM and niche level, in, certainly in Europe, is nowhere near enough of the kind of change that we, we need to see. Frank, in this particular paper, is, is somewhat positive about uh, sort of a 13% decrease in domestic CO2 emissions from transport in the UK over sort of 2007, 2013. Um, I'm a bit, perhaps a bit more cautious. I think if you took into account international travel, the picture changes. And especially if we think about the longer term structural trend that we see from automobility towards aeromobility, uh, then I think the picture becomes becomes quite different. Um, so um, I would say what he shows at the national level about all these different trends happening at the same time certainly also holds at the city level. I've done some work in that space. Cities are really the, the, the spaces where most things are happening, so it's not surprising that most of the research is, is focusing on there. But even there, we see that the, 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 the uh, decline in CO2 emissions is not as much as we urgently need to. I think it is also really, really important to not focus only on the carbon element, which in the context of climate change is very, very tempting and, and very understandable. But this slide is sort of a, a, a diagram that I made for, for a paper I recently, uh, recently wrote, where you see all the issues and problems that a car dominated uh, transport system in cities creates and you see that it is much more than than uh, greenhouse gas emissions and that there's also a very important social and health dimensions that we need to look at so when we think about transitions we need to really look at all these issues and and not isolate uh, uh, the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions to CO2 from the rest. And I think that is really important uh, in, in a number of different ways. And these arguments are being articulated in many different ways. Here is uh, Sylvia Winter, very well-known decolonial uh, theorist from, from the Caribbean, who's sort of 
here writing that, yeah, what we really have is what she calls this poverty, hunger, habitat, energy, trait, population, atmosphere, waste and resource problem. And we really can't just separate out these, uh, we really need to look at how these issues are interconnected. And that also holds really for transport, which means that we really need to think about questions of inequality, of poverty, as well as air pollution, health, and climate change together. I also think it is really important to hold on to a sense of the need to dismantle existing systems. And I have found, at least in my own work, and certainly also in the teaching I do and in the outreach activities to academic and non-academic audiences, that I've started to work more with, with this diagram, the X-shaped diagram developed by Derek Lohrbach and his group in Rotterdam, rather than the traditional multi-level uh, perspective diagram, which I think is still very useful. But what this really does and what makes many people really uncomfortable is sort of this, this downwards arrow uh, that we also need to dismantle the old and, and uh, it, we can't just focus only on the new things which you, you often see and particularly in transport. There's often this idea that if we put all these new systems in place, we let them grow, then things will change in and of themselves. While actually it doesn't quite work that way in transport, we really have to actively destable and dismantle uh, the, the internal combustion engine powered system. It's also important to focus on questions of justice, particularly also when we think about things that are very low carbon. What you see here is uh, York Boulevard in uh, Los Angeles, an area that is now known for the gentrification that is uh, sort of occurring there. And uh, this is very much a developer-led process of, uh, of, of gentrification where property developers are also trying to improve the public realm and what they do in contrast to what you might expect in the European context is that they put in place various types of infrastructures, including bike parking infrastructure uh, to, to attract young, highly educated, reasonably high income um, customers to their new developments, typically condominium apartment complexes. Um, and there's actually a, a premium for them to putting in parking for bikes, because if you do that, you have to do less car parking. Car parking takes up much more space, so you can actually devote more of the, the space that you've got available to, to housing and ultimately extract more rent or, or monetary value through that, which is also which goes some way to explain why in cities like LA and, uh, and Oakland, and, and actually also in London, you see that bike infrastructure has become a symbol of gentrification, particularly for uh, populations and, and, and groups of people at risk of displacement because of the increases in land values, property values. And at times, these, these infrastructures become also the objects of various forms of, of vandalism. Um, and, and I think this very simple picture sort of describes this broader pro uh, process about how gentrification and, 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 and how um, low carbon mobility can really be co-opted by a particular form of urban development, new liberal, quite speculative development, and this system that potentially creates much greater equality, much greater equity that everyone in principle could benefit from, actually becomes a tool that reinscribes and recreates and creates new inequalities in existing cities. So questions of justice here get really framed in terms of equity, in terms of distribution. It's about the distribution of benefit and costs. And this, this quote from two of uh, America's foremost cycling activists, it brings that out very clearly. We see that same focus on questions of distribution in other ways written into transport uh, related transitions 
as well. This here is a diagram with some figures from, from a, a nationally representative survey in the UK that, that colleagues and I did about two years ago. And I think it's a really forceful reminder of the unevenness that is written into the, e, the electric vehicle transi transition in the UK, where I would expect the numbers to be slightly different by now. The, the bars will probably all be a little bit higher but you can, I, I would be, uh, I'd be very, uh, I'd be quite certain that the, the pattern that is shown here, this sort of strong inequalities along lines of income would, would still persist. And that you would still see that owning or leasing an EV or having driven an EV or even being sat in an EV is very much correlated with, with questions, uh, with matters of income. At the same time, I think when we talk about justice in relation to urban mobility, it's really important to not only focus on questions of distribution. And here I've put two pictures together on the slide. Top left is a picture from Oakland, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System. And it's actually a picture taken on what is now known as Black Friday uh, in 2014, when 14 protesters chain themselves to a bar train at West Oakland station and manage to, to paralyze the whole network across the wider Bay Area for almost two hours. That, the, the immediate trigger of that event was the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson. And uh, the, actually that, this protest turned out to be a key event in the formation of the Black Lives lives matter movement. But the protest was also a reaction against the ongoing transition in land use and transportation systems in the eastern part of the San Francisco Bay Area, especially around Oakland, where gentrification fueled by the rise of the tech giants like Google had been accompanied by speculative urban development and displacement of especially black communities. The BART system, which is in place for a couple of decades, has facilitated these developments and the systems authorities have supported the aggressive policing tactics and racial profiling on and around BART trains and stations for, for a number of years. So a very powerful testament of how transport can become a, uh, can become a symbol of all kinds of injustices in this context about race within uh, within modern cities. Bottom right is a picture from London 2020 and sort of September and specifically in the borough of Ealing where some 2000 people came together to protest against the low traffic neighborhood schemes that were installed. We call them LTNs and they're effectively about putting in place filters in residential streets. So think about bollards and, and, and planters that allow bikes and pedestrians to go through, but not cars. So you get streets with that are sort of, uh, that have very few cars in them and that become much more places to live and to be rather than, uh, than essential places that cars move through or where cars get, get stored. And, and in the UK, a number of these LTNs were put in place on the back of the of the, uh, the first COVID lockdown to keep people walking and cycling because we've seen as it's quite significant increase in in those forms of transport in in early 2020. And there are multiple pro multiple frustrations that that sort of fed into the protests seen seen here. Some residents felt aggrieved by the restrictions they found themselves under. But most of the discontent was really about the process. It was about the, the top-down way in which this was implemented. It was done very quickly. It was actually quite rushed um, without proper consultation, without proper participation in these processes. So I think these two protests, while it's very different in, in all sorts of ways, raise really troubling questions about initiatives that promote low carbon modes of transport and that are uh, sort of at the heart of uh, low carbon transitions in mobility. And, and to me, they suggest that justice really needs to be placed at the center of attempts to transition towards low carbon urban mobility. Because if we don't, we, we will run into all kinds of problems. And 
I think in doing that, it is really important that we not only focus on questions of distribution. I've already made that point. And this is actually not a new point at all. It's been made decades ago by uh, feminist theorists, for instance, Ari, uh, Iris Mary and Young, who's, who's sort of, as, as, the, as the quote tells you, argue that we need to look at much more than, than questions of the distribution of, of costs and benefits. We need to look at the institutional processes that are responsible for these patterns of, of maldistribution, because if we don't change those processes, then everything that we're only treating the symptoms if we try to put in place policies that try to address uh, those distributive questions. So over the last couple of years, I've been trying to develop a, a pluralist perspective on mobility justice. Of course, I'm not the only one who's thinking along these lines. There is Mimi Scheller who's done similar work. Uh, there are colleagues in elsewhere in the UK and in Norway who are doing very, very pertinent work. But I think what, what really shares, what, what these, 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 our studies share is this idea that our understanding of, of mobility justice really needs to be complex and multi-layered. That means for me, first of all, that it needs to consist of multiple elements that coexist. Uh, and uh, in addition to distribution, we also need to look at questions of procedure and questions of recognition. So when we talk about procedural justice, we're talking about the nature of decision-making and governance. And that it includes questions about participation, about who is included in these processes, on whose terms are participation configured, what influence can participants actually wield, who is able to make their voices heard, how do we somehow take into account the needs of the people who are not being, not, not participating, all these kinds of questions really need to be at the heart of what we do. And what, when we do that, we also need to sort of work with what feminist theorists in particular have called justice as recognition, which is about the acknowledgement of and respect for the rights, needs, values, habits and experiences of different groups and individuals. And of course, this comes out of the feminist movement, the LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus movement, uh, post-colonial movements, this needs to be developed much further. Now, this notion of justice as recognition is, is in, on one level very sensible and, and something everyone can agree to, but it's also very difficult to get your, to sort of really translate into something tangible. So one way in which that has been done by others is by looking at sub-elements, you could sub-dimensions, you could say, of justice as recognition recognition. And uh, there are two I find particularly important. One is about epistemic justice, the other is about retribution. And epistemic justice is so important because it really has implications for how we produce knowledge. And for academics, I think it's really at the, it raises a number of potentially very troubling questions. So epistemic justice in um, the, 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 the understanding of, of, of Fricker has two elements to it, which she calls these testimonial justice and hermeneutical justice. Testimonial justice is really about whose voices can be heard and, and can be um, are articulated within knowledge generation processes. So who is able to offer their knowledge, their insight? And then hermeneutical justice is about what it then subsequently happens with those voices. How are they taken into account? How are these allowed to make a difference to how we generate knowledge? Retributive justice is essentially about compensation for current or past injustices. Um, and it, I think is a really interesting point to think about, but I think in the transport context, uh, there's some talk about this in, re in relation to long histories of, of racial inequalities in transport planning, for instance, in, in U US cities. But I think other than that, there isn't that much discussion about it yet. It's something perhaps that we need to, to work on going forward. But this question of distribution, procedure and recognition and, and knowledge are sort of really at the heart of what I think
mobility justice is about. I also think it's important to think about justice not as something that is universal or that it's the same, looks the same everywhere. No, it's often comparative. So it's about making improvements compared to what was there before. And it's contextual, so it's contingent upon conditions that have emerged in particular places at particular points in, in time. For me, justice, mobility justice is also intrinsically spatial. It's experienced in and through the spatial arrangements uh, within which transport and mobility takes place. And that sort of is, these arrangements are like configured at different spatial scales. So it is about scales as small as the body all the way up to the scale of the whole planet. And this is a point that Mimi Scheller in particular has elaborated and I think is really important. And I will return to that later on when we talk about electric mobility. Final point to make here is that we should not treat mobility justice or transportation justice, as some people say, on its own. We really need to see how this is intricately related and if not entangled with energy justice, data justice, climate justice, and so on. And I'm happy to talk more about that in the Q&A. Now, if this notion of justice is already quite complex and there are different understandings of it, then the whole notion of a just transition in mobility is even more shaky and fluid. And the way I've started to think about this is to think about it as a sort of, as a, as a spectrum, if you like. And uh, perhaps it, in terms of getting a sense of that spectrum, it makes most sense to focus on the extremes. So on the, on the on one extreme, the minimum, you could say, uh, we're talking about just doing a little bit of work around questions of distribution and essentially sort of help the people who are most, who are burying most of the costs of some of the changes that are happening as part of transitions. But other than that, this is a really traditional kind of uh, way of moving things forward and, and these processes of change taking place. On the other hand, we have the most radical forms of change, which in, in a mobility context really are about the act of destabilization of the system of automobility that really is about moving away from cars to make active travel as the default in a way that considers not that that also considers questions like of, of distribution procedure and recognition to actively overcome the sexism, the racism, the ableisms that are built into our urban uh, mobility system. So this is a far cry away from the kind of uh, speculative gentrification model in, in which cycling and also walking is being co-opted that I, I showed you showed you earlier. This is really about a different political economy. So this comes, this is about uh, actively challenging the capitalist underpinnings of current mobility systems. You can do this through a radical degrowth strategy is one way in which you can do it, but there are others that you can think of more in the anarchist tradition. And the important thing here also is that we sort of, for this to happen, we really need quite different understandings and knowledges of transport, which is an area I'll, I'll come back to later. It's a huge challenge um, and, and something that needs much more work. The final thing to say here is that this kind of change is also really about much more than simply tailpipe emissions. So in this kind of change, something like zero emission transport or net zero transport is, is a, it doesn't exist because any form of transport will always involve some kinds of, of uh, carbon consumption. So we really need to think about life cycles and we need to think about all these other issues that are entangled with questions of, uh, of carbon consumption. So if you start then to think about, okay, how can we move this forward? What can we do empirically with this? There are different ways you can you, you, you can you can do that. And one of the things I got really interested in, particularly thinking about these quite radical forms of uh, transition trajectories, is to look at what's happening around cycling and walking, activism and advocacy. 
and in 2015, so some time ago, now we started this project looking at initiatives set up by organizations, collectives, to uh, make cycling and walking uh, better accessible uh, for uh, a whole raft of different marginalized groups in in two major cities, uh, Sao Paulo and, and London. And what we ended up doing was essentially starting with an innovate and uh, making an inventory of of grassroots innovations in these sectors. And uh, what that showed us that was that in Sao Paulo, there was this tremendous diversity and uh, of, of activities, of initiatives, of organizations, of networks being, being possible. What they kind of what ties them together is that they're all very much interested in questions of um, making cycling and walking better available better possible for for people in various forms of need or disadvantage could be disability gender could be about people in in conditions of deprivation and sort of think of the of the, of the favelas think about children think about all the people in sao paulo it was sort of really cycling and walking and a whole raft of different initiatives being put in place um, there was a lot of paint involved, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, so, so bottom left, you can see one of the uh, initiatives we engaged with, which was essentially a group of activists that uh, create, created do-it-yourself infrastructures to, to assert a right to the street for pedestrians, first and foremost. Uh, but they, similar organizations exist for creation of these do-it-yourself do uh, cycle lanes. And of course, you can you can wonder about the value of this, and a large part of it is about symbolism and is about challenging the way things are done and, and sort of the self-evident ideas around uh, what the place of the car is, is in, in our streets and in our cities. Um, but these initiatives do more than simply create an infrastructure they also create communities they bring people together in different ways and that's perhaps really clearly illustrated at the top left which is one of the staircases that combine that that connects two different neighborhoods in uh, residential neighborhoods in sao paulo sao paulo is a very hilly city it has many of these kinds of staircases that that connect areas and that are potentially very valuable for people to, wanting to do things on foot. They were built at a time in quite different uh, uh, conditions. Originally, the railings that you see here were sort of uh, uh, stone walls or, or concrete walls. Uh, so there was, so you created places of invisibility behind them. And these became actually perfect places for drug trades. For drug trades, so dealers kind of uh, were often found there, and it made perfect sense because these are very accessible places. Many people can reach them; uh, they can clearly move. They can very easily move from there to other places in, in case uh, police or others try to catch them. Um, and what some of these organisations were doing were basically re sort of redeveloping and redesigning these, uh, these staircases. Really through community efforts, uh, bringing on board local businesses, uh, often involving local youth who might otherwise be at risk of uh, sort of following a, a sort of a career in crime, bringing in on board local artists who do the, 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 the graffiti. And we saw many of these kinds of schemes across uh, Sao Paulo and they've really sort of helped to transform the public realm. So these, so these kinds of quite small interventions can have very significant effects. We've seen similar things in, in London where a lot of it was, there was much less emphasis on pain but much more in terms of training whether that is bike mechanics or uh, cycle training, but various ways of building competencies, building, building confidence, bringing people together, allowing people to experience the city in, in new ways. And what all of these schemes do in terms of their 
in, in terms of their differentiation is that they enhance capabilities. And I understand capabilities very much in the way that Amartya Sen and other capability theorists associated with the capability approach understand this, uh, this notion of capability. Now, the capability approach doesn't really exist. There's really a series of capability approaches and different theorists sort of understanding this notion quite, quite differently. But Amartya Sen's original work is really about capability and uh, understood in the context of well-being and being about the freedom to do and be what you would like to do. So it's about, um, it's about, yeah, it is very much about well-being and, and understanding development in a particular, particular way. So this is, I think, a very interesting approach to engage with more within the context of transitions research, uh, not least because it's very flexible. It is pluralist. It, it is sort of, uh, it, it, it embraces value pluralism. It is very adaptable. It can be taken beyond its original framing and it can also be taken beyond its ontological in uh, sort of beyond its individual orientation that you see in a lot of the research um and i don't want to say too much about it here but i think what these what these schemes that we studied in in london and uh, sao paulo really did was give people nurture the capabilities of people to to participate in the city, to participate in mobility, to open up new life uh, opportunities and, and enhance their well-being in a wide variety of ways. And the critical point is that they do this in a way without harming the opportunities of others in the city to sort of uh, live the life that they value. So really fundamentally different from the way um, a car oriented system does where the, the freedom that you as an individual gain from having access to a car almost always will come at the expense of and will actually actively immobilize people who for whatever reason cannot have access to a car. You see here that this is really no longer this kind of zero sum game, but it's really a way in which collectives can can flourish and, and can and, and can, can can lead more valuable and, and worthwhile lives. So that's really where the value of these of these grassroots initiatives lies. Yes, reducing carbon emissions is one aspect of it, but it's really about other things. It's about tackling questions of social inequality. And not only in the sense of distribution, but also in the sense of participation and recognition, as I talked about before. Now, I don't want to romanticize these, these initiatives because there are all kinds of challenges with them. They are sort of continually struggling for resources. They are small and many people say, well, yeah, because they're small, they're marginal and they can't really sort of trigger transitions. I would be quite cautious about that because I think they do a number of things that are very valuable within a transition lens, even if they themselves will not directly trigger a, a, um, a, a transition. And what I mean by this is that we've seen both in Sao Paulo and in, in, in London that these initiatives and the, the things that they do are really breeding grounds for the most radical forms of experimentation, where all kinds of failures are continuously happening. And that's fine, but there are some real gems that emerge from that that then get taken up by more mainstream actors and that come actually, that, that come to inform public policy. We've also seen that these initiatives can sometimes complement public policy and, and can complement it in, in, to the extent that it can provide opportunities for people who would otherwise fall through the cracks of the system. And that's particularly important under a system of austerity and we've seen sort of very significant austerity politics in London and uh, Sao Paulo for quite some time. Now this argument needs to be sort of framed carefully because they should, these kinds of initiatives, these, these sort of uh, 
community initiatives should never become a substitute for public policy and and it sh we should never sort of go down the route well because there is all this community action there is no uh, the state doesn't have to do anything no it's it needs to be the other way around actually um but we yeah they do play an important role uh in in for, for specific groups and as i said earlier they um, create cohesion trust and a sense of community ownership and they can really make a change if they are linked up that's what we saw in sao paulo more than in london actually and they can really influence policy in a very significant way and to that extent they can actually trigger or at least accelerate transition trajectories transition potentials that are present elsewhere at the same time, I am conscious of the arguments of people like uh, Benjamin Sovacol and Frank Gales that uh, a focus on, on justice and transitions may come at the expense of uh, speed of transition. This is a diagram that they produced uh, and, and published earlier this year. It's about energy, but the dynamic is very much the same for um, for, for transport, for urban transport. And, and I agree that we, what we need to find is sort of that, that dotted arrow, sort of where we, we, we find the best of both worlds, something that is both just and effective. And it's for that reason that in recent years, I've been talking a lot, been thinking a lot about electrification in relation to just and rapid transitions. And this table is one result of that. It's totally illegible. And that is sort of the point I'm trying to make here. It is getting very complex very rapidly. And there are many different things that need to be done and that can be done in this context. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail, but if we're thinking about a just transition towards electric mobility, then first of all, it is really important to not just think about cars. I know in East Asia or Southeast Asia, this is much less likely to happen than in Europe. But if we're talking as Europeans about electric mobility, nine out of 10 times we're talking about cars. And we need to look at all forms of transport, that's whether it has four, three, two wheels. And I think that's really important. We also need to do different types of experimentation. And I think we need to think about how we can build epistemic justice into our experimentations. And we've done a project uh, in, in Oxford a couple of years ago where we worked with uh, the local, uh, local authority and we did the monitoring and evaluation of a trial of different uh, charging installations for on-street charging of electric vehicles. Uh, we had no influence over the choice of technologies. They tested five different technologies that you see on this slide, uh, mostly bollards, but some lamppost charging and uh, what they called cable gullies. So they, they, they basically put an installation on people's house and then they, they created a gully for the cable to go through so that people could charge outside of their house without creating a trip hazard. Now, we did that process, but we did this monitoring process. But the interesting thing was that very soon we ran into the question, but what does success actually mean in this context? What is successful charging? When do these technologies function properly? And um, the literature, there's, there's really no literature on this in the academic literature and you can you can I could come up of course with a list of list of criteria but what we ended up doing was sort of through a quite extensive qualitative research process mixed methods over time very laborious but we we in that participatory manner we we managed to create a list of criteria with which we could then evaluate these different um, different technologies. Now, the point of what I'm saying here is not about the specific criteria, but it is about really how you can build hermeneut uh, how you can build uh, testimonial justice, hermeneutical justice into your process of monitoring and evaluation. If you did, and I think we actually were able to come up with much better uh, uh, recommendations to the local 
people um, the authority about what technology, how to sort of extend a project and how to roll out and create a citywide infrastructure that then if we had just stuck to what I or we as academics would have would have thought of. So that that epistemic justice, I think, is is creates benefits for everyone involved. I think it is also really important to think not just about the early majority, the early adopters, because when we're talking about electric vehicles in almost all countries in Europe, except for Norway and the Netherlands, we're still sort of mostly talking about, uh, about, about early adopters. And it's really thinking about, okay, how can we put in place systems that will also uh, speak to the needs of late majority, if not the laggards. Um, I can talk more about this in the Q&A, but I would say that some of our research has shown that what actually these people who are much less likely to adopt a car in the next two, an electric car in the next two or three years will do, they have really different needs and priorities and preferences and concerns than the early majority. And the real final point here is that we really need to move beyond tailpipe, tailpipe emissions and, and sort of really think about justice in a quite different way that looks across all of the value chain that is related to electric mobility. And that includes thinking about the mining that goes into the batteries. Um, it goes, it, it's about the afterlife of the batteries. It's about vehicle production. It's about the implications for employment and all the shifts. Um, we're all familiar with these kinds of protests. I think this is a really powerful example in, in Serbia earlier this year, but we really need to link this to questions of mobility, which means that we sort of Need to read, need to really think about yeah not only uh, electric mobility in conjunction with the energy system and increasingly digital systems, but we also really need to think about production, uh, extraction, and uh, and and afterlife of of the materials that we use. So, coming to an end. What I've tried to make clear in this talk is that I think the real key questions now for thinking about low carbon transitions in mobility are about speed and justice. How do we create rapid and just system change? And I think this has significant implications for how we do our research. In the interest of time, I want to keep it brief, but I'm very happy to elaborate in the um, in the Q&A. I think we need uh, we need to tweak our frameworks. We need to engage with different concepts. We need to engage much more with decades of work across the wider social sciences on insights around justice. For mobility, there is actually in transport and mobility studies, there is a couple of decades of research on questions of equity. Yes, not all of it takes into account participation and, and recognition in the way that I would like, but there's real that there's really a lot of knowledge already available and we should really uh, refrain from trying to reinvent the wheel and really work with that all the knowledge and that also means working with with sector specialists uh, and not also as transition researchers to so bring together the transition community and the transition lenses with, with, with what sector specialists have to say. I think we need, to, we need to think about the boundaries we draw, as I've tried to articulate with this notion of what counts as an electric vehicle and what are the, what do, are the boundaries that we draw around mobility systems and the places where these systems unfold, particularly if we look across that whole, that, that whole trajectory from, from extraction through production, through use to afterlife. And it has implications for our methods, particularly epistemic justice, which is, I think is a real challenge to, to, to get right, but it means much more part in experimentation with, experiment, with participatory methods and participatory research, both qualitative and quantitative in, in our research. I've talked for 47 minutes, my clock says, which is already longer than I would have liked to, uh, had I been given a little bit more time, I would also really 
wanted to talk about digitalization and particularly also about goods mobilities, because I think there's a lot going on in those sectors that is also worthwhile covering. So if you've got any questions around this, do pop them in the chat and we can cover them in the Q&A. Thank you so much for listening and um, this is the end of my talk. <laughs>